So PET is often used in the initial workup of patients with cervical cancer. It's useful to confirm findings by other imaging modalities such as CT and MRI, as well as assessing lymph node involvement and, and thus guides treatment options. PET is much more sensitive than CT and MRI in the sense that it can pick up lymph node abnormalities as small as about six millimeters, whereas a CT scan usually requires nodes one centimeter or greater. Distant metastases can also be discovered through the use of PET imaging. Finally, it can also be helpful for post-treatment assessment of tumor response. Uh, some of the major drawbacks, however, are the high costs and availability since cyclotrons are expensive and fluorine 18 has a half-life of about 110 minutes. So I thought I would throw, throw that in there on PET. Okay. So there are two primary methods of applicator reconstruction, which you've probably, or which you've seen in, in last week's talks. There's direct reconstruction and also reconstruction from an applicator library. So direct reconstruction uses the digitization tools to directly digitize the applicator as seen on the image set. With an applicator library, the planner can use overlay tools to place a known applicator on top of the applicator seen on the image set. An advantage of this applicator library is that it typically be more accurate with a better representation of the source path. And this was shown by Hellebust in the paper that I've, I've listed here. However, with proper commissioning, no matter the digitization method, the total error was less than about 4%. And larger errors can be present that can lead to dose discrepancies, such as errors with contours. So I, I think Adam either has or is going to have a special workshop or talk specific to tandem and ring applicators. I think it's still coming up and discuss the, the reconstruction and also the errors associated with, with the reconstruction. So I'm gonna move on to loading. As I mentioned two weeks ago, there are a variety of methods to load a given applicator, and we'll focus on the one given in your handouts and course materials. So in this scheme, all applicators are using a three millimeter step size for the varying gamma med afterloader and a 2.5 millimeter step size for nucleotron afterloaders. When loading the tandem, we wanna load dwell positions to the outer surface of the ring but not beyond such that the sources are protruding into the ring or even further inferior into the vagina. We would call this scenario a protruding source. And, and this is the same as, as Derek Brown described for the ovoids as well. We want to load according to the plan on this slide, and this is a handout that's available to you. So for the tandem, when we have tandem lengths of six centimeters or greater, we will start with 15 seconds for all dwell positions in the distal third of the tandem, and then 10 seconds for the remaining two thirds of the tandem. For a four centimeter length, we will load the distal half of the active dwells with 15 seconds, and half at 10 seconds. And then if the tandem is short, about two centimeters, then all dwell positions will have 15 second dwell times. And as, as Derek described with the tandem and ovoid, these will later be normalized to the reference point, to point A. So you start with these so that you have the, the ratio. So by starting with that, you'll keep the ratio intact, but then it'll normalize uh, depending on your source activity so that you get your, your prescription dose at point A. For the ring, we will load all active positions with seven and a half seconds and will be symmetric about point, point A. For a 34 millimeter nucleotron ring or electa ring, we will load eight positions on either side. For a 30 millimeter nucleotron ring, we'll load seven dwell positions on either side and for a 26 millimeter ring, six dwell positions on either side. 
For Varian, for the 30 millimeter ring, we'll load six dwell positions on either side. And for 26 millimeter ring, five positions on either side. The planning aims are the same as those described uh, last week in the tandem and ovoid presentation. So we'll start with loading as um, described on the previous slide and then normalize it to point A. So we'll keep those ratios and just normalize it depending on your source strength to point A. From there, we can kind of tweak the dose to cover our HRCTV appropriately while minimizing dose to our organs at risk. And we'll use our, we can kind of do an iterative process going back and forth between our EQD2 spreadsheet and, and our plan. And in, in all cases, you know, I think it's important to, to really go back and forth. And, and once you have a good plan on, say, your EQD2 spreadsheet and you're happy with your HRCTV coverage, with uh, minimal dose to your organs at risk, then it's, it's really important to go back to your plan. Check your isodose lines in all, all views, your axial, coronal, and sagittal. And also look at your dwell control window. Look at, look at the individual dwell times uh, for each dwell position to make sure that you know, after, after adjusting it and getting your, your great plan that there's nothing crazy going on, you know, that, that you have one dwell position with two seconds and the adjacent source next to it has 202 seconds, something like that. So you really want to be cognizant of, of all those. And then any tweaks you make on your plan, then go back and see how that reflects on your EQD2 spreadsheet. So it's really an iterative process. And, and you know, your final check should, should really ensure that all your isodose lines, your dwell positions and times, and your EQT spreadsheet all, all match up and it all makes sense. So finally, uh, for those that missed my other talk two weeks ago, I'll show this again. Just because you have two applicators, your tandem and your ring, it doesn't mean it's a simple implant. There's still a huge potential for a mistake. You have two connectors coming out of the patient with the tandem being most more posterior, the rings more anterior. However, if you're unsure, unclear on which is which, you only have a 50-50 chance of connecting it correctly. And you're gonna get a wildly different dose distribution and medical error if you swap them and treat incorrectly. So this just illustrates that because it seems like it's an easy procedure, you really need to know your applicators and procedures and be 100% confident in your planning and your treatment. So with, with that, that, that is all, all I have for tandem and ring applicators. As I said, there's going to be some live planning sessions and I believe Adam is doing the another ring, tandem and ring specific uh, presentation on commissioning and some more of the dosimetry. So are there any questions, any more questions? wait a minute to see if anything comes in but you know again I'll, I'll reiterate that the the brachytherapy community is is fairly small and you know we, we are everyone's here to help so if you have any questions you know please feel free to you know ask for my contact information or Derek Brown's or you know all, all the all my colleagues who've, who've given previous presentations, talk to, talk to your, your friends and phone a friend. 
you know, these are all, these are all important. Because um, we're, we're not alone. You're not, you're not working in, an, in a vacuum. So, you know, every, everyone is happy to, happy to help. Well, I don't see anything coming through here. So hopefully that means everything was crystal clear. <laughs> Well, like I said, so if you have any other any other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out, and uh, you know I'm happy to answer, or I'm sure Adam or or any of the others, we would be happy to field those questions. And I think everyone will be in touch as far as live planning sessions and further sessions in the in the near future. So I guess with that, I will thank you all for your time and attention. And uh, you know, have have a good rest of the day. Thanks so much.